And welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. Our special interview is with our author, Father Maurice Emelou, talking about his ministry and his book, Scaling the Heights. Welcome to EWTN's Bookmark, you, Father. Thomas. Now, you have a special connection to us here at EWTN, and uh, that's because you came to us how? Uh, that was last year, November. I was invited over for an internship, and um, I stayed here for one month, and it kind of clicked. Mm -hmm. So... It was a nice experience being here, and uh, so excited to be called back to tape a show for... Now, right now, you're in the Diocese of Fresno. Sure. I think you might have been in Cleveland at the time, maybe when you, you had come here at one point in time. Yeah. Uh, and you did your internship. You also did a series for us, right? Yeah. And what was what's the series about? The Faith with Father Maurice. Um, the, the goal of that um, series is to get back to the roots, okay. the basics of the faith. Um, speaking from my um, cultural experience as an African, I feel that though the church is growing strongly in Africa, catechesis is not having a commensurate growth. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to get back to the basics to understand the fundamentals of our faith. Okay. And it begins with like the model of the catechism of the church, but making it a little bit um, have that African flavor. Okay. So from our belief to we believe and all that. Okay, so. great. Now, of course, that was the point I guess I was going. You're not obviously from Fresno nor from Cleveland. Where are you from in Africa? I'm from Nigeria, eastern part of Nigeria, precisely. Imo State, okay. from the Catholic Diocese of Olu, more of a, a rural diocese. Now, anyway. unfortunately for many of us around the world, let alone in the United States, you know, we have some general ideas of Africa from what we see on TV or yeah. in the movies. We probably know more now, at least now, yeah. than we used to. We understand that in the north there tends to be a lot of Islam, yeah. and, and, and then I guess towards the middle and towards the south you find more Christianity, sure. etc. Uh, in your, the area you're from, was that a predominantly? Christian or Catholic area? Or? Uh, the area I am from in Nigeria is 99% Christian. Okay. I'm from the southern part of Nigeria. So uh, the northern part of Nigeria is predominantly um, Muslim. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the southern part has, that's where you have the, a strong um, base of, the, of Catholicism. And mm -hmm. that's where I'm from. That's precisely where Cardinal Arins, a Francis Cardinal. Oh, Arins right, who is very well known here in the United States yeah. and appears on EWTN, sure. actually. With As a young boy, actually, I served Mass. Oh, did you really? Yeah. Is, yeah. Right, right. Now, let me ask you, you put together, you, you've got a lot going on. You're here in the United States. You, you wrote a book, Scaling the Heights. If anybody can, you can. But it's interesting because in reading the book, it appears that this book was actually originally published by N. Trinity Press 2009 in Nigeria. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay, so you updated or adapted the book? Yes, I updated and adapted. I like the way you used it. I updated and adapted some um, um, context to fit into this uh, Western context. Um, the, when the book came, I was in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And um, it was more of a fruit of uh, a retreat, five-day retreat. I preached um, to the youth in the Catholic Diocese of Onitsha. Archdiocese of Onitsha, where Cardinal Arenze is from. Oh, okay. And um, it was a very massive attendance. We had about 15,000 people. And Young. this is what you describe in the book, right? Yes. You talk about this, yeah, this so, right in the beginning of the book. Yeah, so, and uh, after that, uh, I talked off script, but the organizers of the retreat told me they need to have a text of what I told them. And, so that's how I and that's how it originally got put together. That's how it's... And was it was it originally decided to, why why publish it? I know they may want it a text after they saw Yeah, they said they wanted it in book form. I see. Okay. So that's why I entering it to press is a diocesan um, publishing house, so I had to give it to them too. Okay, what's well, interesting too, because obviously you you're pursuing your PhD degree yeah. in communications and media studies. Yeah. And you talk about revising my book for publication. I've made some minor changes, mostly consisting of replacing words familiar to my native country. Uh, I was able to change not the entire text, thus I have added ex explanatory notes when I felt necessary, yeah. dealing with unfamiliar phrases and words. So what would be an example of the kind of cultural change you had to make in taking your original manuscript and making it uh, something that at least an American audience would better appreciate? Yeah, th th there, are, there are some examples I used in the book that um, could be, uh, that my cultural, um, um, my society and the audience I was talking to could relate with, which here will be different. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, some examples, for instance, if I, uh, the way I describe the family relationship and the role of the mother, um, the family and the role of the father and the children and all that, um, here it may be different. Mm -hmm. So I tried to uh, remove those ones that I think that may not relate to the American audience. And some words like program, mm -hmm. program in the British because Nigeria, um, the English we speak in Nigeria was more like British English. Um, okay. King's English, they used to call uh, it. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay. Queen's English, we Queen's call English it. Queen's English now, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So, so E's on the end of words and End of the like double that. M and E. Right. So you have to change it to just P-R-O-G-R-A-M. And right. those little, little right. um, subtle changes that make the whole... And then I would think in uh, some way in reading through the book we give examples that maybe there's examples that someone in Nigeria would certainly understand that analogy. Yes. Where in the United States it, it wouldn't be so clear as to what the point you were making yeah. is, right? Okay. Yeah. So. And also, is it my understanding that the U.S. will change the title or yeah. flip-flop the title here? Mm -hmm. Explain. Yeah, the, 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 the idea about the, uh, the title, Scaling the Height, was my original idea, but mm -hmm. um, I, I felt that for my local audience in Nigeria, um, they could connect with, if anybody can, you can. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, I used it at the time. Mm -hmm. But when I had the opportunity to review what I did, that's why I said I had to get back to the original idea, which was borrowed from the book of Psalm, okay. that with the Lord you can scale the heights. Well, let me and ask um, you this too. In reading through this book and looking through this, you know, someone might look at this with scaling the heights. Uh, if anybody can, you can. It says Maurice Emilou on the front. I might look at this and say, this is. Is this a, a book about faith? It seems to be kind of like a self-help book. Uh, this is, for me, a Catholic book of inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, at that introduction, so, somewhere I said, though this is not um, a, a book of catechesis, it is not um, written with strict ecclesiastical approbation, as I put in the introduction, mm -hmm. but is a story told by a Catholic priest Mm -hmm. my experience as I could share it with my mother or with my brothers and sisters in, um, in the living room. Mm -hmm. That's the way I told the story. And um, I wanted it to be more like a personal discussion, one-on-one -on -one discussion with somebody that you love, you want to share. Um, you, and in that discussion, everything about you comes out of it. But you didn't make it a dogmatic teaching. Right. But you want the person to see uh, where you're coming from. Now, uh, another point I want to make is this. This is not a self-help book. This, the, the goal of this book is to show that no matter how we think we can be better, no matter how we think we can achieve our dreams without God, it is rubbish. Right. That's the ultimate goal of this book. And for me, this book is targeted to contradict all those self-help principles and all those, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know that new age kind of philosophy right. that tries to promote man against God? Um, now, you see, so many places here I said, without God, mm -hmm. right. without faith in God, everything you are doing is empty. So that's the goal of this book. It's just an indirect way right. of attacking those principles. Well, it's interesting. You talk about your family and, and you say one of the dedications is to your mom. Yeah. I noticed in the beginning and, and also to our Blessed Mother and, and to a woman named Jean Curran. Yeah. And who is she? She is the person that took me like her son here in the United States. So I see, I, I see a connection in the whole um, um, uh, issue of motherhood. Mm -hmm. For me, the exemplary mother, which we always um, have strong aff uh, affinity to, is Our Lady, mm -hmm. the, the Virgin Mother of God. That's, for me, uh, the, the source of my love, affection for God. Mm -hmm. My spirituality started with Our Lady. Okay. And from Our Lady, my mom played a key role in my life too. She was the one that introduced me to the type of life I am in. Mm -hmm. um, it's a long story, but she led me to the Lord a day after my, um, she gave back to me. She took me to the uh, Basilica of the Most Holy Trinity and presented me to the Lord in the altar. And from that day, you know, mm -hmm. mothers have strong affection right. that can impact the life of the ch child. Right. And I grew up loving the ministry, loving the priesthood, and became a priest. Right. She died uh, three years after my priesthood, okay. and so I feel that I owe it to her, right. my vocation to the priesthood. And that's why I dedicated the book to her. Then coming over to the United States, this woman took me like a son. Mm -hmm. You know, 
if you come from a different culture, there are certain things about the new culture you may not know. Mm -hmm. For instance, you don't know there are um, times you shouldn't wear white, mm -hmm. white pants. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those little things. <laughs> and uh, if you have somebody um, who's a very strong Catholic, just like Pope um, John Paul II called on priests to take every woman as mothers, as sisters, mm -hmm. somebody that will tell you, you know, you don't say that. You say that. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't dress like this. Right. You don't talk like this. You don't eat this. Those are little things that make right. all the world difference. And right. I, I looked at that woman, her prayer life and everything. I said, you see what? Right. I can see in you some reflection right. of Our Lady. So that's right. why I did get into there. Too. He also ended with, to those who are out of a job and victims of the recent economic crisis. And, and I, I jumped to in the prologue where you talk about that conference you gave and you're going through the realities of an unfortunate condition of the oil rich, most populous nation of Africa and talking about how it should be so good where you're from, but it's really not. And you go through what message would make sense to a people frustrated by not just foes, but also folks. What does that mean? Yeah, is uh, when you say foes and folks, you know, in the Nigerian context, the time I was writing, um, some of our uh, politicians, if I will be pre precise, come from our families from their friends. Mm -hmm. They are members of the same community. And uh, we kind of get disappointed at some kind of p policy um, they um, go for and how they implement those policies. We also get disappointed by those we trust, mm -hmm. just uh, like our Lord Jesus Christ in encounter with Judas Iscariot, you know, friends uh, who are supposed to be friend to Jesus and betrayed him. So sometimes we have that kind of experience of betrayal. Mm -hmm. But we have to really know that we look up to God. The scripture te tells us in the book of Proverbs, um, do not put your trust in men, mm -hmm. in mortal men, because they are mortal. They can disappoint you. We have to put our trust in God. So um, the disappointments could be from those you love mm -hmm. and those that seem not to agree with you. So. That's why I use that expression. I'm interested, too, because you talk about after your talk, many of the participants sought a private moment with me. I came face to face with young minds searching for value in a debased society, et cetera, and you go on. And I think about that, and I think about juxtaposing mm -hmm. that with here in the United States, where certainly from a wealth living standard perspective, uh, things are much, much better than they are mm -hmm. back home. But my guess is uh, the, the kind of frustration, frustrations and upsetment and maybe the spiritual desert that's there, is it the same, worse, better? How is it, is um, it where is it similar, uh, how is it different? I think um, we have a more religious um, community in Nigeria. People tend to believe God more, um, to look up to God more. There may be a number of explanations why it is mm -hmm. that way, but that's the way mm -hmm. it is. Here, you know, people are very comfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, Shakespeare, William Shakespeare said that security is mortal's chiefest enemy. So when you feel that you're secure, you are comfortable, there is a tendency to um, the imitation of Christ, the book, the imitation of Thomas Akempis said, um, um, we, when you, uh, a rich husband man who, um, feels comfortable and forgets about God, right, right. <laughs> you know. Um, so it, it, uh, it, it's, it, it, I think because of um, experiences, maybe the challenges we have, it makes us come closer to God, unlike what happens here. However, I've also witnessed some evidence of strong faith mm -hmm. in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, which is amazing too. So. Um, I may not give the statistics of a correct statistics about the issue, but right. I think it, we have. Right. Well, I'm just interested in your impression, for especially in, in, in reading that kind of a situation and then yeah. projecting it over to here. And you talk about, as you mentioned earlier, this is a story told from the heart as a Nigerian Catholic priest who has been through the ups and downs of life. A child whose optimism for survival amidst hopeless circumstances is centered on God's promises and providence. Now you allude to, I know there's one story you tell about your brother in here. Yeah. Is, that, <laughs> is that part of the ups and downs that no, you that one is in more, your life? No, 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 no. That one is more, is more like, a, like a light moment story. Right. Uh, the, the ups, uh, I will just real quick tell you three stories mm -hmm. that happened almost um, 
consecutively, you know, um, when I was in theology. By my uh, first year theology, my other brother had a, a, an accident, was inv involved in a, fat, a fatal accident. Um, about 32 people died. No. He, only, he was the only survivor of that accident. But he had to be in a hospital for one year because he had complex fracture. While in the minor seminary, I had fracture too. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I stayed out of the seminary for two semesters. Uh, in theology too, that was when my mom um, got sick. Okay. Um, she suffered stroke. And for nine solid years, my mom was bedridden. Was a very young um, lady. Pro she, she had that stroke at the age of 47. Mm -hmm. So for nine years, she was to bear the cross of um, staying like a sick person mm -hmm. for a long time. That experience touched me personally. Um, what I wrote during the funeral, I wrote that my mom's sickness was indeed a tutor. It made me understand what suffering is all about. Mm -hmm. It made me understand what people who stay many years in the hospital, or families who have people who are critically sick, what they pass through, mm -hmm. because I've been there. Um, it was a horrible experience, but hopeful, mm -hmm. because all through it, and that's why I look at my mom also as my model, she was positive. She was always smiling. She was always blessing the children. Mm -hmm. When uh, I became a priest, the year after my priesthood, my youngest brother died at the age of 14. That was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, the year after, my mom died. Mm -hmm. So those experiences, you know, uh, when I was growing up as a little boy, everything was okay. okay. My dad was fairly, uh, fairly uh, comfortable, mm -hmm. and so we had all things going for us. It was... It was your father in the music business? Yes. And he, he owned your brother his, was involved in yeah, the music business. Yeah, in music so, business. So right. he was very, very comfortable. He was mm -hmm. a, uh, one of the founders of the Nigerian recording um, um, industry mm -hmm. in, the, in the 70s and the 80s. Mm -hmm. So, but... From my philosophy days to theology, so many things started right. to teach me what it means to carry the cross every day of my life and to follow Jesus. That's, and that strengthened you. And that strengthened me. But that's me. also the kind of testing that sometimes people fall away. Yeah, well, right. His grace is sufficient for us, you know. Right. So you that's my, what mm -hmm. inspired right. me. Right, and that's why him. you say my target audience is the people who have been through the rough path of life and become trapped in it. And there's an expression here you say, the rich also cry. That's an expression. It's a saying that familiar is familiar to many, to many in, Nigeria. in Nigeria. Okay. Um, the rich also cry is that we believe that no matter how wealthy you are, you still have your moments of sadness. Mm -hmm. Some moments when you feel that money is not everything. Right. You may have, uh, they say that money can buy you big home, big. Uh, beds, but cannot buy you comfort. Right. Cannot buy you rest. Right. So the rich in India, I have had o opportunity to minister to some wealthy people. You discover that they have this kind of hollowness right. that they look for answers to. Well, a lot of times I think what people find is that when they get to the things that they thought were going to make them happy, they don't make them happy, and so then they're, they're stuck trying to figure out, well, what is going to make me happy? Yeah. Yeah. And Precisely. that's where God is the only answer yeah answer that fits that hollowness inside us right yeah now uh, here's who is and i'm not going to go with this name here because you'll kill me if i just pronounce <laughs> it some australian fellow named nick with a v uh, nick v uh, vudovic <laughs> um he's um this man is a uh, not a catholic but i i watched one of his um um stories and mm -hmm. it touched me this man had no limbs but he was very hopeful. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that who else would be a, an example for the younger people? Because uh, he, the time I watched his um, story, he was uh, probably in his 30s. So, uh, and I decided to share that story with them. Mm -hmm. 
Now, in the in the chapter here called "Not a Tale of Woes," you talk of, take on the idea of kind of countering a defeatist attitude. You say a defeatist approach to life is quick to play the blame game, blaming parents, teachers, siblings, colleagues. I'm very much concerned about today's overdependence on psychoanalysis. I thought that was interesting. More and more people are manipulated to think that they have been abused. The result is that most people who struggle with weaknesses have been brainwashed to think they have been abused by their parents, relations, peers, etc. Now that's really interesting because obviously we're not saying that there's not abuse out no, there. No, that's not what I'm but, saying. But to some degree we're getting to the point of where everybody has a reason for why for they why act. why they and act the way. I'm not responsible. We we dodge the just, question. We see that here in the states all the time. Is it yeah. that way in Nigeria? Yeah, too? It's not typically that way. Here. Here. The, this is one of those. Um, you see more here adaptations I had to put in to okay. fit into the context here. Right. Um, the 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 one that we see in Nigeria is we more superstitious. Mm -hmm. We we try to blame. I will talk about that during my show. Right. We try to blame our lack of progress to one brother or. St one sister who maybe should have helped you when you were younger and did not help you, mm -hmm. or um, some may go extra mile of saying um, that somebody was using his or her name in the juju practice, uh, the right, practice okay. of magic to okay. prevent the person from progressing. Okay. I, I mean, so for it's me, not my fault it's not my I, fault, it's right. somebody I'm else. So we back. project right. um, the course to another person. We don't want to be responsible and say, God, I need grace, I need mm -hmm. help, and I want to respond to what you want me to right. do. Right, and I think for all of us, we have to take responsibility and also realize that our parents, you know, aren't perfect either, and you were the teachers or anybody sure. else, they have their shortcomings and failings, Sure, but sure. so, sure. Do, we, so uh, do we all. Another point I want to make about that psychologism is that, you see, granted, some people have suffered a lot of abuse, you know, childhood abuses and all that, but God can provide answer to our problems. Mm -hmm. The sacraments of the church can heal us. Um, prayers can do, uh, help us a lot. We should, uh, you know, the prophecy of Isaiah says, forget what has happened before mm -hmm. and move on. Mm -hmm. Because if you continue crying the wolf, you know, of the past, yeah, every you, time you, you, you mention I mean, that crying you the know, wolf. You know, it, it doesn't yeah. help your problem. Mm -hmm. But you have to say, you know what, I know it's happened. I forgive mm -hmm. and I move on. I well, trust in God. Well, do you think it's because a lot of times it's easier for people to, to give an excuse as to why sure. they're not doing it than actually put in the hard That's work? That's why right? I called it an escapist approach to life. Right. Now, you say at the root of every blame game, which is also a woe report, is greed or a lack of contentment. Good. That's a bold statement, isn't it? Yeah. Good. You see, I was reading um, Lift Up Your Soul by Fortin Jeshin and also his capital, um, the seven um, cardinal sins. Mm -hmm. I was saying that greed can manifest in many shapes and forms. It is not only the wealthy. The poor can also suffer from that kind of greed because they hope to get what the wealthy have. It shouldn't belong to them, it should belong to us. You know, some, we can also be trapped in this temptation of, okay, I'm not doing well, therefore, this person is responsible for my not doing well. What belongs to this person should have been belong to me. The way this person behaves should have been the way I behave. Mm -hmm. There is no problem in you are saying, uh, copying somebody, but it becomes a problem when you say, it should belong to me. Right. That's not good. Right. right, exactly. In fact, it, I thought it was interesting. We don't have time to get into it. In Chapter 9, you have false beliefs you must reject, and you go through... Uh, you, may, through you, may, you may want to watch my show because it's one of the topics I want okay, to handle. Okay, good. good. Really yeah, yeah because it's really nice the way you lay yeah. that out in the back of the book. Yeah. Uh, another line that jumped out at me on page 47, out of all, you said also at the same time with all of this that I read somewhere that too many people filter out praise. Yeah. Why is that a problem? is a problem because, um, you see, we are called to be messengers of good news, not bad news, mm -hmm. okay? When people say, oh, you did well, what do you do? False humility will say, oh, no, I didn't do well. Mm -hmm. That's bad news. But good news will say, thank you, mm -hmm. to God be the glory. I see. That's good news. What you're saying is that you are an example of what the Lord can do, and to Him be the glory. Right. 
So when you filter it out and say, well, so assuming people tell you, Doug, you know what? You are the most horrible person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Doug? I'd you say you've been listening to a lot of conversations in my office. You see? <laughs> so s people, we don't like people to say we are bad. Mm -hmm. We reject it immediately. But why people to say we are good? So that we should accept right. the goodness of the Lord he has used us to do, not appropriating them, but we have to give it back to God and say, God, thank you for this grace. It becomes an inspiration to other people. Okay, well, the real good news is that you're here doing a series for us. That is it time already? Watch, and we're out oh. of time and that you wrote this book and maybe you'll write another. Speaking here with Father Maurice M. Lou about his ministry and his book, Scaling the Heights. And I'm Doug Keck. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Bookmark and look for Father's series right here on EWTN.